Ni hao. Westside Family Church, that is hello in Mandarin. Roseanne and I are here in the beautiful city of Hong Kong. We are here to work with close to 500 churches in what's called the One Campaign. You know, there are not thousands of churches in Hong Kong. There is just one church and it belongs to Jesus. I'm here to launch and to speak for these churches as they launch a Bible engagement campaign. You know, hundreds of thousands of people here have committed every day for the next 47 days to listening to the Gospel of Luke and Acts as they prepare for Easter Sunday. God's Word and God's Spirit is moving mightily here in HK as He is in KC. And so I want to encourage you to pray for us as we pray for you. Oh, by the way, it's 75 degrees here, and I heard about the storm that has rolled in called Scott. Well, that's nothing compared to the spiritual precipitation that's about to fall on you from a message from a pastor named Scott. So as he comes to the stage, I want to encourage you to put your hands together in a round of applause, signaling to him that you're ready for him to bring it. Sufu, that is the word blessing. We'll see you next Sunday, church. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's so good to be with you guys. And Randy, uh, thanks for that uh, little word from Hong Kong. And we know that you're watching and we are supporting and loving you here. Uh, it's good to be with you guys here in the North Sanctuary over there in the South. Uh, if you're watching online and Heidi from Hawaii, uh, we know you're there. And thank you for being so mean by going, Burr, it's 66 degrees here. So yeah, well, we hope you get, well, never mind. We hope it's colder in the future, so good to see you. And then finally, I just wanna give a shout out to our Speedway campus, and I had the privilege of dropping by your Joy Women's Conference uh, yesterday, and you guys just knocked that one out of the park. A great work of God is happening in your church and all around that surrounding community, so we just applaud you for the work that's happening there. So, I don't know if you spend a lot of time on airplanes. Uh, my wife does, she's a flight attendant for Delta Airlines. Everybody say, hi, Donita. I think she's watching this service right now, so hey, baby. Um, that's what I call her, baby. Um, anyway, if you spend a lot of time on airplanes, then maybe something has happened to you that has happened to me. Now, if, if you're new to flying, say, the, the past five or 10 years, you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. But if you've been flying for 10 years or more, then you probably have a shared experience. In fact, you've probably been a victim. Whoa. A victim, what do you mean? A victim of a major conspiracy. A conspiracy, what are you talking about? Here's the conspiracy. Convince people that they need to have more. Wait, 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 when did that happen? Well, here's when it happens, here's how it works. You're in your seat on the airplane and you're really tired. You're almost delirious, but you can't sleep. So you reach in the seat back and you pull out this magazine and you open it up and inside, you find a world of items that before you never actually knew existed. But now you think you've got to have one. And no, nobody would look at these items who is fully cognizant and actually purchase them. But it's too late. You know, they've kind of captured your imagination. And now you realize, I've got to have something in this catalog. And so some of you in your homes right now probably own something like this. Maybe it's the pet observation porthole. <laughs> or a Bigfoot statue for your yard. Or because you love kittens, you had to have a little, uh, a, a little thing for your kitten, a little hammock for your pet. Or, or maybe you own the Mount Rushmore Garden Art. And I don't even wanna ask for a show of hands, it would just be too embarrassing. Now, the truth of the matter is, there's probably nobody in this audience or watching online that has fallen victim to that, but if you do own a Bigfoot statue and you have it at your house, I probably will never be invited over now. <laughs> but there is a reason why they have these things in the magazines, and do you know what that reason is? Because we buy them. This is the reason that they're in there. And it's kind of a funny, kind of an interesting, kind of a humorous uh, way of looking at you and me and our relationship with our money. And so we're gonna talk about that today. 
And uh, this is a part of a larger conversation we've been having in our journey through the Bible, these 30 key ideas called believe. And if you're new to our church or if you're new to watching online, uh, there are three major categories for this series. There are 10 key beliefs, 10 key practices, and 10 key virtues. And we are in week nine today of our key practices, and we're talking about giving my resources. Now, if you have a Bible with pages that turn or a screen that scrolls, go ahead and go over to 1 Chronicles 29, or in your Believe book, you can go to page 304. Now, let's just talk about the elephant in the room for a minute, because if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're, you're not a, a, a Christian, I know what you're doing right now. You're kind of going, I knew it, I knew it. The last time I was here, last year, you talked about money. That's all you guys ever talk about. You just want my money. Or maybe you're a West Sider and you brought somebody today. And you know, you've been working on this a long time. You're like, oh, you love my church, you love my church. You know, we talk about God and Jesus and the Bible and loving one another and serving our community. You're gonna love it. And you forgot we were talking about this today. And you're like, I'm so sorry. So I get it. And if you're a follower of Christ, this is for you. If you're not a follower of Christ, I'm gonna give you a pass on this, okay? I'm talking specifically to those of us who say, I follow Jesus. But if you don't follow Jesus, you, you, can, you can listen in and you might just feel something happen to your heart. Now, the reason that we talk about money isn't because we want your money. The reason we talk about money is because money is in the Bible, in fact, there's probably more written about money and possessions than most other topics that you find in the Bible. And the reason that God puts a lot about money and possessions in the Bible isn't because God is so concerned with money, it's because God knows that we are. He knows that we are, and so that's why we wanna talk about it. We'll start here with a key question. How do I best use my resources to serve God and others? And I wanna show you how this fits into the broader context of our believe journey, because it starts with a belief. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God, it starts up there. Then it moves to the practice. I give my resources to fulfill God's purposes, but ultimately we're wanting something to happen inside of us, and it's a virtue. I am known by others to be a generous person. So we wanna look at this holistically because this is not a talk that is really about giving money, it's really a talk about becoming generous people. And there's a starting point for all of this and it's probably not one that is intuitive to you, but it's found in a Bible verse that is very familiar to you. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The starting point for a conversation about giving my resources actually goes back to a theology of God himself. At the heart of the story of God is a loving creator, a heavenly father who gave. You see, here's the deal. Generosity is rooted and the character of God. So when, when we talk about giving, and when we talk about God, it's not so much something that God does as much as it is something that God is. And this is what God is wanting to cultivate in our own lives. God is a gift giver as a person, and he wants us to be one as well. And so I kinda wanna... Uh, flip the switch on what might be your current understanding of you and God and your money, okay? When it comes to giving our resources, God doesn't want something from us. He wants something, say it, for us. Now, that's an interesting take. God wants access to our hearts, not our wallets, because he knows if he can capture our hearts, then he can transform our hearts so that we can actually be generous people. This happens to people all throughout the story of God. And if you go back about 3,000 years, it happened to a guy named David. David was one of the great kings of the nation of Israel. And David was a great warrior, a, a great political ruler, a great spiritual leader. And toward the end of his life, David looked around his palace 
and he kind of realized, wow, my house is better than God's house. And if you know the Hebrew scriptures, you know that uh, the presence of God in the old covenant was actually contained or represented in something called the Ark of the Covenant. And the reason that you know about the Ark of the Covenant isn't because you know the Bible, it's because you watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. I know, okay? Let's just all be you know, honest about that. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was actually placed in something called the tabernacle, which was really just a big tent. It wasn't that impressive. And so David looks at that, and he looks at his home, and he's like, I'm going to build God a temple that is worthy of his name. But here's the problem. In the dream stage, God revealed to David, he said, David, you're not going to get to build it. There's too much bloodshed in your past. There's too many bodies in your wake. And so your son, Solomon, is gonna get to build the temple. Now, instead of being devastated by that news, something really interesting happens because it flows out of David's heart. David decides he's gonna raise all the money and get everything ready for his son, Solomon, to pull the trigger. He's gonna raise all the money. He's gonna put together the architectural teams, the construction crews, all the artisans, everything. So all that Solomon has to do is pull the trigger. So he spends the majority of the last years of his life getting ready to have a project built that he will never lead. And he weighs in big time with his own personal wealth to the tune of what would be a modern day $17 billion. But what makes this even more significant is that he's raising all this money and investing all of this energy to build a temple that he will never see, to build a place of worship where he will never worship. And it was all because of this. And now as he modeled generosity, he invites others to participate. And this is what the text says. Now who is, say it, willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. They gave toward the work on the temple of God, 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jehiel the Gershonite. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David, the king, also rejoiced greatly. And so you see here, there's this extravagant generosity that is going on here. And they weren't doing the thing that, that I've done in the past, and maybe you've done in the past, where you're like, how little can I give and still be good with God? Somebody tell me where the line is, right? They weren't saying, how little can I give? They were saying, how much can I give? Because godly giving comes from a heart that is what? Willing. Willing. It comes from a heart that is willing. Notice he didn't say, I'm the king and I command you to give. No, no, no. You can't coerce this kind of generosity. They wanted to be a part of it because David invited them in. This is a very, very important word. He invited them to consecrate themselves. We're gonna see this a little bit later when we get to the New Testament. But the word of consecration is an idea of I'm surrendering myself to God. Everything I am, everything I own belongs to God. I just offer it back to you. This is the bigger idea that is in play here. And so for the people of that day, it wasn't a financial thing. It was a heart Thing. Now, Jesus, a thousand years after that, he knows it's a hard thing. He was talking to the people of his day, and if you have uh, your Bible with you, you can go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. And he's talking to people who were concerned about the future, who were wondering about uh, what's going to happen. They're concerned about, is, is everything going to be the way it's supposed to be? They're, they're worried about their daily needs, and is what I'm going to need tomorrow going to actually be here tomorrow. Not that the Bible has anything relevant to say to our lives today, right? Yeah, it's very, very relevant. And he comes to the topic of fear and worry, but what's curious is his entry point into this conversation is actually money. 
This is the way that he puts it. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your, say it, heart will be also. Jesus says, here's the deal, guys. Every one of you, you're already investing. Now, let's talk about this. It's just a matter of what you are investing in. And Jesus says, my advice for you is to invest in something that is gonna be here in the end when you actually need it. Because these earthly treasures, the stuff that we accumulate, our money and our possessions today, they are fragile, they are temporal, they are vulnerable. Do not let them grab your heart. Why? Because generosity is restrained when money has our heart. It just can't go anywhere. And it happens to all of us, or at least we all feel the pull, right? I mean, most of us, if we would actually admit it, would say, yeah, I've got a Bigfoot statue by back in my past someday. It's back there. We've all done it. And what I'm learning is that when it comes to generosity, it's not, that we, that we, it's not something that we don't want, but it's something we just, we hear this right, we can't yet. We did this study called Reveal. We've been talking about this throughout the series where we've taken kind of a snapshot of where we are as a congregation in terms of our spiritual journey. And one of the questions was asked around this idea of giving my resources. And it was stated like this, I give 10% or more of my income to my church. And the percentage of you who said yeah to that was actually 37%, which is pretty good, but that leaves out the other 63% of us and where we would all say, you know what? I would like to be in a different place, but I'm just not there right now. And I don't know if you know this, but the number one reason that people are not more generous with their resources isn't the amount of money that they make. No, 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 no. We, we know this. The number one reason people are not more generous is because of financial margin. We've gotten ourselves in a place where we want to, but we can't actually do it. And so this fall, uh, we're gonna be talking about this because we realize this is a common point of pain and struggle for people in the church, for people outside of the church. It is a universal situation. And so this fall, uh, we're gonna be bringing something to you. We're gonna do something that's never been done before in Kansas City, and we're getting ready to unveil this to our core leaders. And once they have heard that, we're gonna bring it to you and invite you in to be a part of it. And God's gonna do some super significant stuff through all of us. Because when it comes to generosity, we all want to get there, or at least we want to get back there, because somewhere along the way, we had been convinced that we needed more. And I'll be the first to confess, it's happened to me in the past. When we were living in Arizona, where it's 70 degrees right now, one can dream. Uh, we moved from one house to another house, and this house was a pretty good house, uh, and I'm a, I love living outdoors, and so uh, my, the backyard had a pool, it had a, a chimney, a fire pit, and it had an outdoor grill, but I wanted more. So I put in some new grass, and I put in some landscape lighting, and I put some palm trees, you know, shine the lights up in those palm trees, and everything was really cool, really, really happy with it. People came over to my house, they went in the backyard, like, man, your backyard is awesome. I'm like, Thanks. About two weeks after I completed my project, I get invited to a friend's house down the road. And I went through the house and I went into the backyard and he had a big pool and it had lights that kind of rotated and different kind of lights. It had a grotto and his deck was multi-level, had a complete outdoor kitchen, two fireplaces and a sport court. And I was like, my backyard sucks. You know what I'm saying? Anybody, ever, any, come on, some honesty here. Anybody ever feel that way? Or maybe, you know, you've been driving your car, you've been really good, it's kind of old, and then your friend gets the brand new car and you're over at their house, you're like, whoa. You look at it, you look at the lines, you're like, can I, 
can I, can I get in it? You're like, yeah. So you sit in it and you're like, oh, it feels, oh, you feel that steering wheel. And then you, you smell that new leather. You're like, oh, new leather. Man, my car smells like family. <laughs> like, oh, man. It, it, it happens to all of us, right? I want more. I want better. I want new. I know. I'm like that too. You see, generosity is restrained when money has our heart. But here's the, here's the adverse on that. Generosity is released when our heart has our money. Now, now it's getting good. You see, when generosity happens is when our heart has control and it drives generosity. It gives us access to something that we wanted to before, but we couldn't get access to it because our money was calling the shots. You see, Jesus knows that his audience and this audience, all of us in this universal community, all struggle with putting our trust in one of two things for security. He says, you're either going to put your security in money or in God. Well, how do you know? How do I know which one I'm trusting in more, okay? Well, which one of these statements creates more anxiety in you? There is no God or there is no money. There is no God in the universe or there is no money. You see, if I'm counting on money and I find out there's no God, I'm like, eh, okay, got my money. But if I'm counting on God and I somehow find out there's no God, now I'm concerned. Now I'm worried. Whoa, that changes everything. But if I'm counting on God and I find out there's no money in my account, I'm like, okay, I still have God and God can provide the money. You see what I'm saying? It's a fundamental distinction in our attitude. And this is exactly where Jesus was leading us when he said this, you cannot serve both God and money. He says money can't replace God as the kind of the, the source of our trust because the presence of money isn't as sure as the presence of God. And when you are sure of the presence of God, then we are able to open up our hearts to be generous. This is what he's talking about. And churches are learning all about this. And if you go back a couple thousand years ago, there were a group of churches that were learning this. The Apostle Paul is kind of involved in this deal. He's writing uh, to a church that he had planted, Corinth, that had a lot of resources, and he's starting a GoFundMe project for the church in Jerusalem that was poor. And he's encouraging the church at Corinth to actually step up to something they already said they would do. They would already said, here's the amount of money that we're gonna give, and now he says, hey, follow through on what you have promised. He says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently, I love this, pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. It's really crazy what he's doing here to inspire the Corinthians. He's citing the generosity of the Macedonians, and I don't know if you notice it in the text, but what he says here, it has nothing to do with the amount of money that they had. It had everything to do with the amount of heart that they had. It was always about the heart. The Macedonian churches were poor, but they gave like they were rich. And it all goes back to this little phrase. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. And there it is. I don't know if that looks familiar to you, but it's the same idea that we saw back in First Chronicles chapter 29. It's all around this idea of consecration. 
That is the bigger story here. The money goes where the heart sends it. That's why God wants access to our hearts. And then Paul does something really interesting. He taps into something with the church of Corinth, kind of an ego stroke, because they were known as a church that had lots of gifts, lots of resources, lots of talent. And he says, okay, because you're known for that, I I, I just wanna invite you into something. And this is our key verse today. Let's read this together. Go, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I love what he's doing here. He says, you wanna be known for something? Do you wanna leave a legacy? If you wanna make an impact, if you wanna trend well into the 21st century, then lead with generosity. And Westside, so many of you have been doing this. We have been able to do so much for so many in this church, in this community, and all around the world because of you leaning in. I first heard about Stephen Ministry from my mom. I just was curious, what is that, what are you doing? I was fascinated. And then I heard that the church here at Westside was gonna be training some people, and I couldn't sign up fast enough. That just sounded like exactly what I wanted to do. Well, a lot of times I'll uh, get all into a room and, and they're surprised. They're, they're moved by the fact that the church has someone to come and visit with them and, and pray for them. Lifelines are groups of individuals that gather together to talk about similar experiences they may have had. Um, they're very easy to join. You just find one that speaks to you and your life experience. There's ones around grief, divorce care, addiction issues, sexual abuse issues. Uh, I had some experiences in my life that I had gone through alone. And then later on in life, when I came to be a believer in Christ and been, became active in the church, I realized there was a much better way. And I wish I had had that when I was going through it. And so I joined in and became a leader. Pastors can't do it all. So we come alongside someone who's hurting, uh, who may have had a death in the family, who may be caring for a, an elderly person. It can be just a difficult time in their life. They just need someone to talk to. So we prayed for this woman. We anointed her uh, with oil. She was uh, very anxious, couldn't stop talking. She hadn't slept for, for quite a long time. And uh, I had talked to her about a week later after we had done all of this. and. Uh, she said she was doing better, and then uh, several months later, I saw her at one of the family baptisms out by the pond, and uh, I noticed it was her, and I didn't even hardly recognize her. The transformation was just uh, unbelievable, so uh, that was really, really neat to see. After God put it on my heart to become involved, I simply started talking to some of the staff here at Westside, and um, it's amazing that they were able to provide for us not only a curriculum but the materials but the place to meet and um, put it out online for advertising all at no cost so that people could find the groups when they need them and it's invaluable it's an invaluable resource my husband was diagnosed with um, he was diagnosed with lung cancer in 2014 in september and he was gone in august of 2015 um, and i found myself after the 15 weeks of training all the books I'd read, all the training I'd have, the caring I'd done for other people, it's different when it's you. But when you're walking that walk, you, you know the signs of grief, you know what's coming next. But when it's you, so I reached out and I got my own Stephen minister. Well, it, it, uh, it always helps me to bring uh, the Holy Spirit to the surface and uh, not just for me to bring my spirit to the surface, but hopefully my spirit interceding with their spirit will be brought to the surface also. Um, not only is it amazing to be among non-judgmental people that are based in Christian beliefs and talk about real life experiences that you have in common, but if you put God's word and his love in the middle of that also, it's magical. And that is not found any other place. I'm not just a Stephen minister. I was asked to uh, help lead uh, the Stephen ministry training for the, our lay people, for people in the church that, that want to come alongside people and do that walk. 
I took the shape test and found out my first gift is faith, my second one is mercy, and my third is service. So it just really fit me uh, to be a Stephen minister, and I love it. Yeah, I, I would like to thank the church for uh, giving uh, us the ability to uh, visit these people, uh, to create this ministry, uh, to have a heart for these people. I, I appreciate it very much. And for this church to do that for us is, is incredible. It's, it's a program that I don't think you can put a dollar sign on. They are a tremendous resource. You don't have to go through anything alone here. And the support and the love that you find is, is overwhelming. Stories like that never get told unless somebody decides to be generous. And, and it's really a, just a great reminder that generosity is the key to leaving a legacy. And this is what Paul is trying to drive home when he kind of wraps up his conversation in his letter. He actually says, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. God gets praised, stories get told when people get generous. And the reality is none of us are gonna live forever on this earth. Our lives are going to come to an end and there's a question that I just heard this week by Pastor Andy Stanley, and he says, when it comes to the end of your life, do you want more stuff or do you want more stories? Because when you come to the end of your life, people aren't gonna be talking about your stuff. They're, they're hopefully not gonna be talking about your pet observation porthole or your uh, Bigfoot garden statue or your pet hammock or your Mount Rushmore garden art. I, I sure hope there's more to the story. But they could be telling stories that were created by your generosity. And Westside, every time you give to the ministry of this church, whether it is ongoing or whether it is our future expansion, every child, every student, every adult who has their life changed, you have a share in that. It's a part of your story now. And I want it to be a part of your story. That's why it's so important that when we come to this key practice today that we unlock this door to giving my resources. And when we unlock the door and we reveal our key idea and let's say it together, I give my resources to fulfill God's purposes. And when you step through this door, here's what you prove. You prove that our God can take a heart like mine, maybe a heart like yours, a heart that was once so fearful, so fragile, so afraid, and he can transform it into a heart that is bold and trusting and adventurous, a heart of generosity that releases the resources that we have that we once kept to ourselves into the hands of God for him to do something grand and glorious for his kingdom purposes. And I can't wait to see what he will do when we do. Amen? Let's stand together as we pray. Let's pray together. Well, Father, here we are, and as we kind of begin this conversation, everything that we are and everything that we own belongs to you. And so you know our hearts, you know every person who is in this space, who is watching this online, and you know where you want to lead us. And so for those of us who want to be generous but we just can't right now, would you work by your spirit would you work through our teaching? Would you work through community so that others can be spurred on to make wise decisions, hard choices, sacrifices to get to a place where they actually want to be? 
And for those of us, God, who by your grace are in a place to be generous, continue to stir our hearts and open doors and provide opportunities so that when we come to the end of our life, we have created story upon story of life change because of the generosity that you have produced within us. And then, God, we will be careful that whatever is done, it will be done in the name of Jesus and for your great glory, we pray in your name. And everybody said, amen. Great to be with you guys, and uh, hopefully this was encouraging to you. I just want to remind you, if you need prayer for anything, there are going to be prayer partners right here at the foot of this platform, uh, also in the South and Speedway and online. And now, would you just prepare yourselves to receive this benediction? Now, as you go, may light with no darkness fall along your paths. May love without fear and bitterness be in your hearts. May truth without falsehood be in your minds. May the peace of Christ be at the center of your lives, and may the presence that can never be taken from you go with you always. Amen. See you next week, guys.